Okay. Hello and welcome to Reality Coaching for Writers. I'm especially excited today to welcome our guest, Craig Bombusik. He is a friend and a well-published author, and he always has great information to share about the writing journey. So, Craig, welcome. Well, thank you, Diana. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, I'm so excited about your new book. Could you share your title with us? And then I'm going to ask, um, we usually start with a question. So share your title, and then I'll I'll throw out our question that we're hoping okay. you'll answer for us today. Sure. Well, the new book is called Telling the Truth, How to Write Narrative, Nonfiction, and Memoir. Telling the Truth. Oh, that's good. So our and question today. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So our question today is, what makes narrative nonfiction so powerful? Well, I... I, when I teach on this, which I normally do at writers' conferences, I, this is the subject that more and more I'm being asked to teach on. I talk about the power of true stories. And in my thinking, if you are a fiction writer, it's all good. And there's power in fiction writing. But I find that there's, I would say, more power telling true stories because the reader has to grapple with the fact that this thing actually happened. And so often, I mean, in the book, I talk about the importance of gravitas. And that word is the same word that we get the word gravity from. It's the weight of the story. And as a writer, I encourage uh, other writers in their decision-making on what stories to tell and what to spend their time on to consider the factor of gravitas. How weighty is this story? Mm -hmm. And so when someone is reading one of our books that has gravitas, they have to grapple with the fact that this happened. And quite often, that's why we as Christians uh, speak of the term amazing grace. Why? Why is grace amazing? Well, because you and I know in our relationship with God and in our experience in life, that there are times that we get to in our lives where we're between a rock and a hard place. And it seems like there's no escape. And this is it. I guess this is it. This is where <laughs> the ship's going down. And somehow God intervenes and rescues us and delivers us and sends the unexpected check, the unexpected helper, the unexpected protection, the unexpected escape. And we have to sit back and say, how, what, what just happened? The other thing um, that I find really interesting, and I, I saw this in two of the books that I wrote that are uh, kind of straddle the fence between narrative nonfiction and biography. One is called I Am Cyrus, Harry S. Truman and the Rebirth of Israel. And the other one is called Victor, the Final Battle of Ulysses S. Grant. And in both of those stories, you can see patterns over the course of a lifetime that you sit back and you say, whoa, that looks like it's more than just coincidence. This is especially, mm. well, in both books, there is that. But in I Am Cyrus, um, right during World War I, when the British are fighting against the Ottoman Empire and they're pushing into um, the Holy Land, into what the Romans called Palestine, which was a dig uh, that was named after the Philistines, the old enemies of, of the Jews. That's why they called it Palestine, to say, look, you're defeated, and we're going to name this after the people you hate. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas the Jews call it Eretz Israel. So uh, the land of Israel. So the British are moving in there. And just at around that time, there was a shakeup in the war cabinet. And there was a new prime minister that came in. The old prime minister was almost anti-Semitic, was not in mm -hmm. favor of helping the Jews at all. Whereas the new prime minister was David Lloyd George, who was homeschooled, evangelical, 
and he was what was called a restorationist. This is someone who believes that the Messiah will not come until the Jews are restored to their promised land. <laughs> and wow. he's the one who is replaced just before the British start moving against the Ottomans, mm. the promised land. Then the foreign secretary was Arthur Balfour, homeschooled, evangelical, restorationist. And then one of the key members who was an advisor and became uh, first Lord of the Admiralty was Winston Churchill, who his father, his best friend, his father's best friends were all Jews mm -hmm. uh, or mostly Jews. And his father died very young. and Winston Churchill was very young. And all of these Jewish friends gathered around his deathbed and said, we will make sure that young Winston is raised properly. And they kept their promise. So Winston Churchill was raised by these prominent Jewish business leaders and politicians. And so he wow. had this huge heart for the Jewish people. Mm. These are the people who came into power right at the point where a decision had to be made. What are we going to do when the Ottomans are defeated with this land? Well, what they did was they came up with what was called the Balfour Declaration, where Great Britain promised the Zionists, the Jews who believed that they needed to go back to their promised land, which, by the way, was nearly empty at this time. You know, that's the thing that people don't realize. Go back and look at what Mark Twain wrote in the late uh, 1860s. He said it was a desolate land with hardly any people in it. Wow. Uh, now, there were Arabs, there were Jews, there were Ottomans, Turks, there were Christians, there were Armenians. There were people there, but it was just not that many. And the Turks over 400 years had allowed it to fall into this wasteland without much life. So mm -hmm. when the Zionists started coming into Eretz Israel in the 1880s, which is when Zionism began, they came into a land that was, you know, not flowing with anything like milk and honey. It was flowing with dust and malarial swamps. Oh. We need to recognize that when the British promised Eretz Israel to the Zionists, in the in the 1910s during World War One, it was just starting to get uh, brought back to life. And what happened is the Jews were doing all this work, pouring all this money and all this human energy in. And what it was doing, it was raising the whole uh, standard of living. And so it attracted tens of thousands of Arabs from the surrounding lands. Wow. And so Historically, we need to recognize that this was never, there was never a state of Palestine. There was never a country called Palestine. It was a, uh, they called it a province or like a state within the Ottoman Empire. And it was the size of Pennsylvania. And during World War I, the British said, we're going to promise you that land. Well, then fast forward to World War II. Who is in power? Well, a guy uh, named President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt would have never given the Jews Palestine. He would have never done it. Mm. He just, it wasn't in his heart. But he died after only uh, three months in office in his fourth term. And the guy who took his place was a guy named Harry S. Truman, who was a Bible-believing Baptist, had read through the Bible several times, and he was probably the greatest historian we ever had as a president. And yeah. so he knew not only the history, he knew the Bible and he knew the American aspect of what would be good for America. And it was, God said, we're gonna take this person out and we're gonna bring in this new person who's gonna work with me. And Truman, it was Truman who, was, who said, let's make this happen in the UN. And that's why the vote went in favor of partition for the Jews to return to their homeland of Israel. So you look at that, you say, wow, yeah. right exactly. when it needed to happen, it happened. So these, this is why I believe in the power of true stories. Mm. Yeah, I love how you just gave us that, that view, um, especially when Israel is so much on our hearts right now. That's yeah. a book that I highly recommend. Um, such a good, good book. Um, so you had made a comment 
that we're wired for story and there's science that backs this up so that it's it's actually throughout history we look at how cultures and civilizations have used story to pass down you know their culture and their uh, legacy to their children i come from an amish background oh, wow. and story is very much a part of our legacy and um, I can remember sitting with multiple generations on the back porch um, after Sunday dinner discussing all of our history. And it's sadly going by the wayside, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But um, luckily, the Amish are very meticulous about recording their history and their lineage because they won't intermarry with English Men. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so they have to have uh, really understand the uh, uh, their heritage in the fact so their children don't intermarry too close with other cousins. They like there to be at least a generation, you know, apart from that. So story um, is something I grew up with that was very valued. Yes. And I I love it and I miss it, but um, you did mention when we're writing nonfiction, and I think that's why I enjoy reading your books, like the one where you spoke about um, using the internet. <laughs> Fish, how was that? What? Yeah, oh my it's, gosh! It's called Netcasters using the yes. internet to make fishers of men. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And I have a copy well underlined and I have used it so often with my clients over the years. Um, it was quite a new thing, Craig, that you were tapping into before right. anybody else was. And now we know the power of using the internet to fish yeah. and, uh, for others, but you use story there and, um, so do you want to share a little bit about that Wired for Story? And Yeah. Well, I have a whole chapter on the science of story in Telling the Truth. And I'll tell you, it was fascinating to do the research on this and to discover that this has happened over the last 70 years. That, uh, you know, in, in the history of mankind, that's a very short amount of time. So we're just coming into the place where we're recognizing that story isn't just entertaining but it is mapping the future for the next mm. generation. We mm. have what are called mirror neurons. You know, I used to work at Focus on the Family and I went in and talked to my uh, boss who had his uh, PhD in psychology. And we started talking about this subject and I brought up mirror neurons and he got all excited. Mirror <laughs> neurons, that's so exciting. And what they are is that these are... Uh, Part, this is a part of our brain that attaches to story. When story mm. is told or when it's viewed, whether it be a play or a movie or a video game, it attaches to our brain. And we actually take it in. And it's part of, um, you know, at a very naturalistic uh, place, it's part of our survival mechanism. We listen to the story and we say, I need to know what I need to do to survive and thrive, okay. or yeah. I need to know what I should not do so that I can avoid, you know, it's like that movie, The Croods, you know, the cavemen, and they would come out of their cave every morning and they'd say, still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Um, we don't think that way, but uh, the stories that we tell our children, the movies that they watch, they're all implanting these ideas of what do I need in mm. order to, we may not necessarily be thinking survival, but how do I prosper? How do I do well in life? My father never knew these things, but he said to me at a young age in my teen years, he said, read a lot of books. He said, you can learn in reading one book what it takes that author possibly an entire lifetime to learn. Yes. And so the more books you read, the more lifetimes of knowledge and wisdom you're taking mm -hmm. in. 
I talked to my daughter about this. Uh, she's in her 20s. And, and we were talking about this generation, millennials who've grown up with all this knowledge at their fingertips. And what happened, the Bible tells us that knowledge puffs up, uh. that it can cause pride. I see that. I've seen that as a professor in classes where these students think they know more than the professors oh. do. Mm -hmm. I've seen it um, even in the workplace with younger workers who do know a lot and they've got a lot of technical skills. And so sometimes they think they know so much that they know more than the older people. But what I shared with my daughter is there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. They yes. have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't have wisdom, you may be applying that in ways that can lead you down a path to destruction. The Bible says that a man yes. may think in his heart that he knows all this stuff, but in the end, it can lead to destruction. And so pride comes before the fall. You build up your mind with knowledge, you become prideful, and if you don't have wisdom, and if you're not seeking what scripture says of principles of how to live, you know, like like Charles Colson uh, quoting, um, oh, now I can't think of his name, but uh, quoting that famous line, how now shall we live? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question becomes, we've got all this knowledge, but how do we live? And so the mirror neurons help in both sides. They help on the one side with the information. They help on the other side with picking up the wisdom by okay. watching. You know, they they say that wisdom is better caught than taught. And yes. that's what happens with the mirror neurons is that it's picking okay. up those things. And quite often it's through the power of story. So in a book called The Sacred Balance by David Suzuki, Rediscovering Our Place in Nature, he says this. Taken together, our memories and perceptions form an autobiographical self, a set of personal myths and stories that give our lives meaning. Now, mm. I am a, my day job is I am a chaplain right. and serve in a retirement facility in a community. And um, when I was doing my chaplain training, one of the things that we were taught is that our job as chaplains is to help the, uh, co the community resident or the patient in a hospital or in a hospice to make meaning. And we did that by storytelling, by them huh. sharing their stories with us. And it helps them to look back and to see the meaning across their lives. Well, what do we do as writers? That's our job. We make yeah. it. One of the things that I share wow. in Telling the Truth book, kind of throughout the book, is that as writers, what we're doing is we are taking the important bits of a life story, of a true story, because to tell a linear story of life is boring. <laughs> what we're doing is taking the highlights, right? And yes. we're weaving those together from a disparate, very a confused and convoluted universe, we are taking that in and we are weaving it together into a story that then we can pass along to others. And through the reading or the hearing or the watching of that story, they then are making meaning. The mirror neurons are picking it up and saying, oh, that's a lesson I need to remember. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a part of the whole of our existence. And that's why storytelling is so important. That's mm -hmm. why Jesus taught in parables. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Eddie and I talk about that so right. often. Right. Um, before we were around, before mirror neurons were understood, Jesus understood. Well, and I loved how you said, you know, we don't want to be mired in the minutia of all the tiny little details because it is boring. Um, but hitting the highlights um, is definitely, you know, the lessons learned. Somebody said, and maybe you can help me who said this, but they said, order is made out of chaos. Maybe it was you. Order is made out of chaos. 
uh, by story. So yes. that's, um, that's the message of telling the truth. Of there the you go. Yeah. Yes. So we take our life journey with Christ and we try to dis, you know, emanate, get it down to distill it down to actions and, and lessons that others can grab a hold of. Right. Exactly. And why is it that after a church service, we're heading out to the Golden Corral with our family and we start to talk about the sermon. What do we talk about? The stories. Yeah. It's the stories that impact, mm -hmm. stories that stick. Now, obviously, the scriptures are important. Obviously, the lessons are important. But what we remember the most is the stories. Yeah. It says, the word says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's right. And when I hear other people's testimonies, it encourages me. It's, you know, and it's so cool how often those come across our path right when we need it. And Holy Spirit, just, you know, the great orchestrator <laughs> is, is arranges those, you know, divine appointments with uh, words. But I just, Boy, as I see uh, the world getting more chaotic, I think more than ever this message is needed, Craig. So I'm so glad you have this book. Well, thank um, you. Real quickly, tie it in with memoir. Um, because when I heard you teach on this subject at the Philadelphia Writers' Conference, Christian Writers' Conference, um, I was interested to see what how you would connect it with the telling a personal story um, in a memoir, because I find this is what I found as an agent. And you might find this interesting, but in the Christian community, it was very difficult to sell a memoir yes. to a traditional Christian publisher. Yes. And yet memoirs sell like crazy in the general marketplace. And my conclusion was that the church is familiar with amazing God stories. Mm. We're familiar with them. Mm. And unless there's somebody big and, you know, um, on in social media or TV star or something big, we we generally just went, oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah, because of our familiarity yeah. with right. God doing amazing things. Yeah, a kid who's basis. a quadriplegic at 14 and he becomes a medical doctor. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Post. So, yeah. I love that man's story and I yeah. could not tell it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, exactly. we got together and yeah. we we're all kind of shocked that no one picked it up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yet the general market that's trying to figure out life. They're trying to find something to, uh, you know, they're adrift and they're trying to find a foundation under their feet. They are the ones that gobble up these stories, trying to learn life lessons, like you said, yeah. Yeah. something to hang on to. And I think now we're coming back a little bit around, which I'm happy to hear in that the millennials are adrift and are looking for a foundation. They have yeah. no absolutes. They yeah. have no. And for those of us that have gone through the Jesus freak movement and right. the Jesus revolution movement, we see that we're primed perfectly for another uh, time like that because yeah. we were at that time in the seventies looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for answers to really hard questions the vietnam war and all that other stuff you know so um we have about 10 minutes left craig so what yeah if i oh go ahead i was just gonna how say do you want to wrap up what parting words would you like to share yeah let me um, just uh, uh address the memoir part of the book because okay. originally the book was going to be narrative nonfiction, memoir and biography and i thought this is just too much and I was thinking about cutting memoir and just making it, you know, maybe doing three different books. And, uh, but I thought, no, I need to leave this in here because it is so closely tied to narrative nonfiction. It's just that it is a parenthesis 
of truly interesting, a uh, truly interesting element of someone's life. That's okay. what sets apart from an autobiography, which is the whole life, right? <laughs> it's a parenthesis that is okay. particularly fascinating. And I like that. What I said in the book is exactly what you said, that in the Christian markets, it's difficult to sell. I said, however, there's a couple of things to consider. One, if you are well-known, you can find a, a publisher. If you've got an audience already, then mm -hmm. it'll be all right. Uh, and then the other thing that I said is, and you may want to put it out there just because God tells you this story needs to be out there. Yeah. That might be something that someone will self-publish. Uh, just because they want it to be, uh, you know, something that's nailed down for, for them, their family, the people they influence. And I said, so if you feel God is telling you to do this, then you need to be obedient, even though you know that, well, it may not be a big seller, but I'm doing it out of obedience. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to wrap, I love that. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. To wrap things up, um, the other side of the Telling the Truth book is uh, how to marry the fictional techniques of plotting and structure with a true story. Uh, because if you're telling a narrative, you've got to tell it in a narrative fashion. Uh, you need to understand the arc of a story. You need to understand the arc of characters. You need to understand not only the basic three-part structure, but also do you want it to be a four-act thing do you want it to be a five or six or seven act thing i personally like to keep it simple to three acts but my son he's like yeah i think we should go with five acts on this and i'm like <laughs> okay well, let's figure that out because he and i are uh we're adapting uh the victor book into a 10-part tv miniseries oh awesome so he was like yeah, yeah five acts for for this uh for this episode and then the other day we were talking he said yeah i I decided to whittle the pilot down to four acts. And I was like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on the pilot and we're working on the organization and then the pitch deck for that. But in doing all of that, we recognize that the story needs to have structure to help people to follow along. One of the things that I bring out in the book is that our life reflects three act structure. That's why Aristotle picked it up back in the ancient times and why right. it still works to this day. Mm -hmm. Look at our lives, childhood, adulthood, old age. You know, mm -hmm. look at a trial, a jury trial. You have the opening statement, you have the pre presentation of evidence. And then what do they call the last part? They call it a summation. Summation. Uh -huh. They wrote the word as summary. Tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them <laughs> what you told them. It's what just you just told word. them, yep. New Journalism's role. Right? <laughs> and so um, it works, but you need to know more than just the basics. You need to understand, well, what do you need to set up in the in the first act or in the, uh, in the opening part of the book? How do you introduce the characters? How do you introduce what is called the status quo world of your hero or your main character? Who is the villain or the antagonist? Who's the protagonist? Mm -hmm. Maybe the the uh, villain isn't even a human being. Maybe it's something an alien, or or maybe it's some sort of a a movement. You know, in my I'm working on a Holocaust survivor book, and the enemy there is Nazism, and the hero is this young 19 year old girl who lives through World War II, and so in the beginning I set up her world as a, you know, a uh, a decently well-off young girl whose parents have worked hard and have their own business. And then by the end, uh, in the final denouement, as they, as they say, uh, she uh, reemerges in her hometown in rags, filled with all mm -hmm. kinds of disease, famished, and she's the only one in her family that had survived. So that is an arc. Right. Uh, from this uh, status quo world through the hell of World War II and the Holocaust, and then coming out on the other side, a survivor. And so the book goes into extreme detail on how do you do that? Oh, that's so good. We we should have you back on to discuss that. Well, I'd love that to. Would make for a great episode. Um, and I just um, 
in my own life, loving story the way I do, I think um, now that we're seeing that science backs it up, I think that we need to really promote um, and encourage those that, like you said, if you feel called to write something and share something, then do it because how much longer are we going to have a window of opportunity? That's right. We do not know. That's right. We do not know. But I know, Craig, that you um, do the same as Eddie and I. We always tell people, do your best. Right. Professionally edit your book. Do if you're going to self-publish because you're not well known, but you do have something to add to really important conversation that the world needs to is having you know a discussion they're having then um make sure you do it with excellence make sure okay. if you have price name on it that it's done with the excellence and um i know everything you do that's why i can put my stuff 100 percent behind every book craig's ever written because he does it with excellence well thank you you know i like you, we've all learned as we've gone along. And I've made my 